So how do you follow up a book with tyrannical, evil, immortal lord rulers and, and magic and strong characters and crazy character deaths? Oh, it's very easy. Political intrigue. A leader is often judged by how well he bears responsibility. As king, everything that happens in your kingdom, regardless of who commits the act, is your fault. Manipulation works so well on a personal level, I don't see why it wouldn't be an equally viable national policy. What is a government but an institutionalized method of making sure somebody else does all the work? People who underestimated you were easier to manipulate, and honesty does not make a man less of a tyrant. It's easy to believe in something when you win all the time. The losses are what define a man's faith. But a man is not defined by his flaws, but how he overcomes them. Hey, what's up, bookworms and Lord Ruler Brandon Sanderson fans? Mike back again today to talk a little more Mistborn. And now we are on to book two of the original Mistborn trilogy, The Well of Ascension. This is a book I feel like has kind of a mixed response from the fan base. People uh, that love it, really love it. And other people feel like uh, it was a step down from the first book. And I even said in my last review that in my memory, this one, not quite a slog, but it definitely slowed down the action for a little bit more of the uh, political intrigue, as I put it. If there's, there, there is one phrase I use for this book. It is definitely political intrigue, but you, it's not just that. I feel like it's kind of gotten bogged down to where people think it's just a book that is straight politics. Yes, the middle section is a lot of political posturing and things like the assembly, which is basically Congress and things like that. I, I, I get that, but the third act is the usual Brandon Sanderson <laughs> you know, uh, with a big, big battle and all those things. But uh, before I get into it, guys, just want to reiterate that these are spoiler reviews. So if you have not read, obviously, The Final Empire and now Well of Ascension, uh, I probably go back now. And, uh, and you know, you can check out, I, I did uh, right here, I did my video on why you should read the Mistborn trilogy. And that is non-spoiler, but I decided to go spoiler on these videos because, well, I didn't want to just repeat everything that I said in that video three times. So uh, yes, guys, if you like the first book, yes, you should probably read this one too because it is one full story. Now, uh, I'm not going to be as, as long-winded as I was in the last video because I'm not going to reintroduce the characters and the magic system and all that. I'm just going to talk to you as if you know these people and if you know how the magic works. So if you need a better explanation, please check out my review for Final Empire right here that tells you all those character names and what the magic does and how that works okay so we are just going to get right into it here start with the plot this one is about a year after the last book ends eland is now uh transformed luthadel into a democratic kingdom that he rules over so uh just pretty much how we expected uh he's he's rewritten the laws and all that kind of things to to be a democracy and, and it makes a lot of sense with the way that the last one ended uh so I'm glad that like a year has gone by because there are a little bit of jumps in the story in this one that you're kind of like, that seems awfully quick, but it makes a lot of sense. Obviously, uh, after ending the Lord Ruler's reign, there's going to be a quick little rebuild there, obviously, and a transition of power and uh, establishment, reestablishment of you know laws and things like that. So it, it makes a little bit more sense. Also, the relationship between Eland and Vin. And guys, I'm going to keep saying Eland because that's what I read it as. If that bothers you, I do apologize. It's just... That's how I am. That's how I read it. I don't listen to audiobooks, so if that's how I read it, that's how I'm going to say it. So you can keep saying Eland, and I'll keep saying Eland. So there it is. Um, but uh, right here, if off the bat, Straff Venture, that's uh, Eland's father, he shows up with a force of about 50,000 strong outside of the uh, the city walls and decides he's going to take, he's going to retake control of the city. You know, he split during the end of the last one. But uh, he is back now to uh, take back his place as uh, the head of the strongest house in Luthadel. 
But uh, Elon fears that the assembly, like I said, that's think of that kind of as you would Congress, uh, that the assembly is going to uh, surrender the city to avoid any bloodshed, and Elon goes to deal with them. So they're, they're setting up your major branch of politics in this one. Me, I think that Brandon Sanderson writes politics really well, so I found it very intriguing, but I do understand that this kind of lost some first-time Brandon Sanderson readers. So meanwhile, we pick back up with Vin, and she is going to meet Orisur, and uh, she's ambushed by a group of Alamancers, um, but uh, she's helped by someone that comes to be known as the Watcher. That's how she's actually able to fight them off. And on her way back to Elan, she has a brief encounter with some kind of like mist spirit figure that on the rooftop that she she pushes a coin towards and it just vanishes. But uh, she calls it like a mist spirit. So right off the bat, you're like, okay, lots of new things going on with Vin, and you kind of want to see what's going on with her and Orser because you know the way that the last one ended, she really didn't want to have anything to do with Orser. And uh, if you don't recall why, like I said, go back and, and, and go into that that video. But uh, Hammond tells Vin that the Alamancers were sent by Ashweather Set. Now Set is a ruler from the Western dominance in this of Skadriel, so um, it, it makes a lot of sense that. Uh, they would see these as vulnerable and think, okay, this is a good time to be opportunistic. So you've got Straff Venture coming to retake what he believes is already his, and then you've got uh, Set showing up with his army thinking, no, you know, hey, hey, why don't we go ahead and just take care of that for you? So uh, if you're not into politics and you're not into a, a long castle siege kind of story, might not be the one for you. Um, in hindsight, when I started, you know, what I did, guys, because I read these three years ago, is I've been kind of skimming over the past couple of months when I knew I was going to be doing those reviews. And uh, I'm like, okay, I, I can see how this did distract me a little bit the first read, but I feel like I would, knowing how rewarding it is down the road, I feel like it's worth it and it, it, did, it wouldn't bother me at all in a reread. But I can see the first time it kind of bogging you down, especially if this is your introduction to Sanderson like it was for me. Uh, we skip over to Sazed, who has a much, much larger part in this book. Uh, I felt like he was a character that was kind of a tertiary character in the first one that you kind of felt like could be important and had big moments, but I feel like he is one of the main cast in this one. And if you're going to say that there's a character besides Vin or Elin in this book, uh, it's definitely Sazed's book, I felt like. And, and I welcome that because I am a big fan of Sazed. I, I love everything about him. Uh, but he's working with some villages in the eastern side of the map, uh, and he's investigating a mysterious, a mysterious deaths that are caused by these daytime mists that make everybody like shake, and then they just like die. Uh, but uh, the most intriguing thing I found about that chapter was that you find out that people, while they you know suffered during his reign, they they came to rely on the Lord Ruler to the point where you know they were they felt like they were taken care of. You know, sure they lived under tyrannical rule. And they might not have liked everything, but, you know, at least they were provided for. And I thought that was real interesting, especially when the ruler said, you know, if you kill me, you doom everybody kind of thing. So that's already playing in the back of my head. But uh, seeing that, you know, these, these, just these peasants are like, you know, why did they have to take away the Lord Ruler? Because at least before, you know, we were, we were at least taken care of. So it's one of those kind of uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of things. And looking at it from two different points of view, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. And, and I like that. I felt like no other fantasy author at the time would have done something like that. I thought that was really, really cool. And you could probably come up with a dozen responses about things. But off the top of my head, I couldn't think of anybody else that was doing that in modern fantasy at the time. So it was a really neat idea. Even if it was just a, a passing sentence, it just, it, I don't know, for some reason that one really stuck in my craw a little bit. But uh, then Marsh shows up and he validates the uh, the daytime mist stories that he's seen it happening too. But he asks Aza to accompany him back to the Steel Ministry while it's empty to uh, to kind of just look for some some clues there, just search it out. Uh, then you go to Vin and she is uh, now in possession of Orser's contract, as you know, and she decides the best thing for her to, him to do is to not take another human body because she can't think of think of it that way because uh, they have to consume the. the consume the bones of the dead person to take on their appearance. So he decides for him to use a wolfhound as a new body. And uh, so this, you get your get your good, good boy in his book kind of thing. And uh, I, this is a character I think that is, has grown to be loved quite a bit uh, from the fandom. And uh, it's easy to see why it's easier to love a dog than it is a, a big, big, big scary beast in a conjurer, right? So, you know, I usually do these in one long stretch, but the kids are home from school, so there's going to be some interruptions here. Uh, so that's what that is all about. But uh, Vin acquires something called Duralumin, a new metal that uh, she isn't sure what it does until she spots the Watcher again 
on patrol while she's on patrol with Orser, and it turns out that this metal just enhances the ability of other metals. So since she's already burning tin, which enhances your senses, uh, she basically has like a sensory overload and passes out. And while she's down, this watcher fella comes up and asks her why she why does she play their political games, uh, talking about Eland and the assembly before he just just takes off. And this is the first of many takeoffs from this character, and I'll get into that as they as they happen. Uh, back in the Ministry, Marsh tells Sazed that he needs to be in Luthadel and not doing his whole ter Mother Teresa act with, uh, with, with these villages or whatever, and he doesn't really argue with them. But at the assembly meeting, Eland uh, proposes that they enter negotiations with his father. And, and they, they, they do agree after a vote, and then a message arrives that another army has approached the city. And like I said, this is Set's army. And Breeze is with them. He explains that he was trying to play advisor to Set in an attempt to force a standoff between uh, Set's army and Straff's army. It makes sense, but it's it's a stretch, right? It's a stretch. But uh, then guards discover the fresh bone. Some they discover but some fresh bones in the palace, uh, and, and indicating that they have been infiltrated by a Chandra. So there is your whole. Uh, who is the the, the the Cylons? You know, if you watch Battle, I, I bring up bring up Battlestar Galactica a lot in these reviews, guys. It's because I love Battlestar Galactica. Uh, one of the most intriguing things about that series was who were actually human and who were Cylons. You know, it, it so I, I kind of got that vibe in this here. Like, okay, is it, it, it's got to be one of our, our our main crew members, right? So the whole time you're thinking, God, you know, one of our crew members has actually been killed and been infiltrated by this imposter, and that's how I felt the whole book. You're trying to figure it out, and I'll just go ahead and tell you, I didn't get it right. I did not get it right. I suspected so many people. Uh, my main thing is I thought it was going to be Dachshund. I really thought it was going to be Dachshund. But uh, we'll get to it here. Uh, so as Marsh and Sazed explore the still ministry, they find bodies. It's like everywhere. It's just a massacre in there. They split up and Sazed finds this steel plate with this terrorist writing on it that proclaims that this character named Alindi was the hero of ages. And the writer realized that he had to stop him from reaching the Well of Ascension. Now, these are the verses that are before each chapter. There's a quick little sentence. It's supposed to be writings from this not this tablet and this logbook that he kept while they were on this journey. And uh, it, it makes a lot of sense when you read it a second time. I didn't reread these before this, but I did read the each thing before each chapter, and they're a lot more clear this time. So that's a nice little bonus for you in a reread there that those actually make much more sense this go around. And it's very satisfying, honestly. Uh, but Marsh eventually decides to go his own way, and Sazed is captured by an army of Coloss. Now, I, I, Coloss, I just kind of imagine them as my head. I think they're actually a little larger, but they're human-like. BC, I kind of imagine them like Uruhai from uh, from Lord of the Rings. Uh, but you know, I don't believe that they're quite sentient. They're just kind of mindless rabble. They just, you know, they aren't really speaking or nothing like the Urukai, at least not yet. And uh, that's uh, when they meet they meet their their leader. Uh, it is a man named Jassus. Yes, a human is kind of leading these guys. And he demands that Sazed becomes his, uh, I guess, his steward, like his advisor or whatever. And Sazed says, no, I'm busy, bro. And he splits. But um, he allows Sazed to go and deliver a message to Eland that his army will allow will ally with them if they can coexist in peace. So it sounds too good to be true, right? Yeah, because it probably is. I might be remembering that wrong, so... One thing I learned in the last video is people are going to fact check this and they're going to let me know what I got wrong in the comments. And I appreciate that. But uh, I ask you to have some mercy because like I said, it was three plus years ago I read this and I might not be remembering everything right. Uh, Vin gets to know Orser a little better and she inquires about Chandra society. And I'm all into this. I want to know more about these guys. And uh, he says that the Chandra imposter is not allowed to enter human society without a contract and they cannot use allomancy nor be affected mentally by it so there is a big one there that that plays into the rest of this book uh, but Vin does see the mist spirit again and decides she's going to confront it and things don't go well she ends up falling from a third story window uh, she burns the proper metals I don't remember which one to ease her fall but she's pretty much scared of the the mists at this point and uh, meanwhile, Elin is kind of arguing the best way to deal with the two sieging armies outside the walls. And a woman named Tindwill arrives. Apparently, she is a friend of Sazed, and she has come to tutor Elin on how to be 
regal. Uh, basically, uh, she gives him a makeover, a crown, a uniform to wear, kind of a, a, to the wards, or just basically teaches him what it means to be a leader and to inspire others. And uh, I feel like the fandom's kind of split on her. Some people just absolutely hate her. Uh, I feel like she was a necessary evil. I mean, this guy isn't going to go from being, you know, the heir to understanding how to rule a kingdom overnight. And you, you would say, okay, well, what about people who have had to do this? Yeah, you know what? There was a learning curve, and I'm sure they had numerous advisors. You know, this is a complete fresh start. So, you know, he probably didn't have anyone that he needed to advise him on the best ways to uh, to, to be a leader. So I actually welcome it. Sure, she's abrasive, but I feel like you got to be. You can't handle something like this with kid gloves the whole time. So uh, I'm fine with her. I'm fine with her. Uh, the little weird romance they have with her and says it. Uh, but uh, I'll touch on that in a minute. But they receive word that's trapped. Straff Venture has sent a messenger, and it turns out to be the Watcher. So he obviously he is working uh, for Straff. He says his name is Zane, and that Straff needs to meet with Eland in his camp as a parlay. Vin does not make it known that she has met with Zane in the past, but she goes and confronts him afterwards, and they have a brief fight. And Zane tells her that they are both Mistborn, and uh, and and they belong with the Mists, you know, not with the nobles. And this is where he first starts, uh, join me and I will complete your training kind of thing. Uh, but uh, he leaves again and then wonders if she can get him to flip sides, not the other way around. So, so cute. We get our first Zane point of view and it's revealed that he is Elin's half brother. Uh, so, okay, that's interesting twist. I, I feel like in fantasy, everybody's always related somehow. Uh, but he apparently he hears voices in his head and uh, he tells Straff that he is gaining Vin's trust. But the whole voices in his head has the big revelation at the end of this. Uh, right now, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, this guy's just batshit, right? Okay, you would, you would think that if someone came into, say that uh, someone was a misborn and they weren't mentally stable, but they still had all the same power. These are kind of things it's like, I talk about uh, if you were a Buffy the Vampire Slayer, they had a, B -B -Buffy the, if you were a Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan, like I am, there was a character named Drusilla, and Drusilla was actually driven mentally insane before she was turned into a vampire. And now she's a vampire that is still mentally insane. So I kind of looked at that like that with this about how if you're someone who has some mental issues, but you're still misborn, it's not like you just don't have those powers. You have those powers and you're a little bit unstable. So a real dangerous new threat there. Uh, so the crew is discussing plans for Elan's parlay with Straff and Set's daughter Alrian. I think I'm saying that right. She arrives asking for asylum and looking for Breeze. And you find out her and Breeze have like kind of a weird little relationship there. But uh, Doxon suggests that she is used as leverage against Set. So uh, never let a good opportunity pass you by when it comes to politics and war. Uh, but Ven has been conducting tests on members of the crew this whole time to see if they are actually who they claim they are and not the conjurer that has infiltrated them. But she rules out Breeze and Hammond here after detecting their use of allomancy. And kind of like in the last one where you had each member of the crew like did like her level up, as I put it. In this one, every once in a while, she just she spends some time with one of them to see if they're actually themselves, if it be it testing to see if they're using, you know, allomancy, because what we established is that conjurer cannot use allomancy. But uh, testing that way, asking them personal questions that only they would know the answer to, things like that. So it's a nice little cat and mouse game going on. Uh, but Zane arrives and he questions Vin over not using her power for her own benefits. Like I said, unstable and you still have the use of these powers. But th these are good questions. These are good questions to ask. If you're so freaking powerful, why are you at heel of someone else? You know, it's always an age-old question in a story like this. But uh, he's basically tempted her to use her power to do whatever she wants and says that they could be freed if they help each other. So, you know, she's kind of tempted. You know, she uh, understands that this guy will understand her more than Eland ever will. So you've got the makings of a love triangle. And I'm like, I, I, no, I don't, I don't see that or whatever. Uh, I feel like you kind of thought it was going to go that way. But I don't, I don't really believe that Vin ever has feelings for Zane. She just understands it he'll be able to understand her in a way that Elon never will. So I didn't look at it like that. Others have said that, yeah, she was in love with Zane or whatever. I, I never really read it that way. Uh, maybe it'd be different on a reread, but that's that's just kind of how I felt. So we're back to after the parlay. Eve, uh, at the parlay, Elon uh, offers to ally with Straff to defeat Set's army. 
and then he will step aside and go back to being Straff's heir. But Straff refuses and asks to speak to him alone without Vin. And he tells Elin that he already has a treaty in place with Set, and he wants Elin to simply surrender the city. And Elin tells him, yo, get bent. I'm not going to do that. And uh, Straff orders him executed, but Vin shows up, and he backs off and says he also has a Mistborn of his own, which turns out to be Zane. And he, but he still decides he's going to go ahead and let them go, but he gives Zane new orders. He wants him to kill Vin. He also confirms that the Chondra spy is his minion. So um, nothing really unexpected there. I was surprised that him and Set already had a, uh, already had, you know, an agreement agreement in place. But uh, again, that's politics, and Straff seems to be very Tywin Lannister in that way, where he's always got a plan. Uh, but upon return, Elin receives notice of a vote of no confidence from the assembly, and he is no longer king. So they're kicking him out here. Uh, but uh, members of the crew suggest martial law from Elin to uh, keep himself in power. But Elin says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to follow the rules that I wrote, and I'm going to try to reclaim the throne using the proper channels that I put in place. So I got nothing to respect for Elon in this because I feel like anyone else would have been like, eh, I'm going to do what I can to stay in power here because these other quacks, they are loonies, right? It's normal. It's normal. But uh, says that he brings back the rubbings from the steel ministry and he asks, and then Ben reads through some of them and asks him what the deepness is. Remember the last one? I think I called it the darkness. It was the deepness. Uh, he tells her there are theories but there's nothing that is concrete as fact. You know, she suggests that the myths are actually, um, why they're acting so strange is because the deepness is coming back and that having uh, daytime mists will eventually lead to famine and only the hero of ages will be able to stop it. Says it disagrees, but he kind of agrees, but he can't let her know that, right? Uh, Ela presents the idea of electing a new king to the assembly and it, it comes down to him, uh, Lord Penrod, and Set. Set somehow uh, got his name on the nomination, and he is somehow in attendance at this meeting, and he speaks on his behalf and gains a lot of support. And as a nominee, he is now allowed occupancy within the city walls. So, wow, okay. Um, again, these are the politics that I think would be riveting if they were done like on television. I can see how they might be a little dry to people reading in a book. But uh, yeah, I, I feel like the politics in this are every good as a Song of Ice and Fire or First Law or something like that. Again, I think it's all personal preference if you like his writing style or not. But uh, there was numerous times where the politics had me being like, whoa, whoa. Yeah, so good, good to me, good to me. Uh, Vin wonders if she actually is the hero of ages, and Orser tells her of Chandra religion and prophecies. It's something that they don't do very often, but they believe that humans will die off since they are of ruin, while the Chandra are of preservation. So this is the first, you know, the first time I read this, uh, I didn't know anything about the Cosmere being something greater or anything. I had no idea what a shard was or any of that kind of stuff. So these are the kind of things in, in Skim. I'm like, whoa, he really was planting these seeds early. I had no idea. So uh, it makes a little more sense in hindsight. I, I was just saying, you know, it's like the values of, of ruin and preservation. I didn't know he was talking about like a higher power. Uh, so that's neat. Uh, but he also tells Vin that the Coloss and the Chandra have a bond. Nice little seed that she plants there, he, that he plants for her there. Then continues investigating members of the crew. She does clear Doxon. So at this point, I'm really clueless. I have no clue who the hell this could be. Uh, she brings up their conversation, the first one about nobles, and about how he said basically there's no such thing as a good noble and they shall be killed. And he, he says, you know, he softened his stance on that a little bit. And this is enough for her to clear him. Even though Orisher's like, mm, not so much. You know, they can, they can know things. Uh, but Elon thinks that Set is inevitable he's going to win this election it's not going to be close and he wishes that he would have allied with him earlier but uh he keeps hearing these rumors of a poison well in the city and goes off to investigate that for a little bit and it's something that keeps coming up over the course of the story. i'm not going to keep bringing it up every time it happens but it does seem like every about five or six chapters you hear something about this poison well uh but uh after that ben is attacked by zane and she realizes that he is burning atium and he tells her that Straff wants him to kill her, but he offers for them to just run away together instead and reveals to her that, that about, about his relationship with Eland. 
and then he just does his usual and he just takes off again. I mean, this guy loves to show up, give you a few lines, start some shit, say something kind of condescending, and then just zip off. And it's something that doesn't stop until he's uh, until his exit from this book. Uh, Elon and Set have a dinner parlay and they discuss Breeze and Ulrion as well as making a trade of food. He, he offers, or actually Set offers a trade of food supply for uh, for their ADM stores. And Elon says, look, uh, that sounds like a good trade and all, but we've been unable to find the ADM store. And the meeting ends without any real progress. But on the way back, Elon tells Hammond that he thinks he knows a way to get enough votes to stop the deposition. Uh, ben continues to observe members of the crew. She removes clubs from the list. Uh, when she tells it, she, she can tell that he is using a copper cloud. And before, I think that uh, there's a vote. They go back to the assembly, and you're waiting to see what this is. I think Ven, or sorry, Elon had joined like some kind of church of the survivors, or something which is basically like a religion based off of Kelsier or something like that. I don't know, thinking that, that would gain him more sympathy vote or something like that. But I felt like it was just kind of something that was. It might mean more than I took it as. In my memory, it just kind of really didn't amount to anything. I don't know. I might be way off on that one. That's just kind of where I remember. But uh, while they're in the assembly, he actually gets attacked. There's a group of members that are alamancers that attack Elin, and Vin helps them fight them off. But it turns out that they're trying to kill both Elin and Set. So Vin goes ruthless and just starts killing the shit out of these people. And it freaks Elin out a little bit uh, to a point where he just kind of backs off or whatever, and she's appalled by his appulsion, and, and she just kind of passes out from exhaustion. But uh, Elon and Hammond deduce that Straff is the one who sent the assassins, and the assembly continues their vote, and Penrod wins rather easily, becoming the new king of Luthadel. So uh, this whole time I thought it was going to be Set, and he was going to have to work with Set, but it turns out to be Penrod, this character I haven't really even talked about that much. I mean, because his name is Penrod. <laughs> but uh, Straff is pissed at Zane for not being able to kill Set and Eland, and even more pissed that Vin is still alive because uh, he's, he's kind of scared of her. But uh, he then meets with King Penrod, who has been in Straff's pocket this whole time. And uh, he tells him that he intends to turn the city over to him, but Straff tells him, you know what? You can keep the city. You can stay king. I just want the ADM stores. So uh, it's revealed that Zane tried to poison Straff at one time, and Straff decides that Zane has outlived his usefulness and says that he must die and sends assassins after him. But uh, Vin awakens and is told in, is told by Orser that uh, he, he's, he's now using a new body, um, and in Penrod is now king. But uh, I think it's just another dog. I don't really remember. I, I remember that Orser is a dog pretty much this whole series. Uh, but Elin recoils when she tries to touch him, and she falls back asleep. And when she wakes up again, Zane is there. This guy just loves to pop in and pop out, doesn't he? He tells her that Set was the one who sent the assassins, and that Straff is in cahoots with Penrod. Hmm, half truth. But he gives her some adium, and he takes off his... He does this whole Batman thing before disappearing again, before she can even look up. Like I said, that kind of seems to be what he does here. Uh, Orser visits with his new dog form and drops a bombshell on her about the Chandra. And he says that the Lord Ruler created them all and built in kind of like a, a, a one ring to rule them all, kind of fail safe, which can uh, put them under, you know, to control them. They can control the, the Chandra and the Coloss. And uh, yeah, that's a, that's a big one. That, that could become very, very important later, right? Yeah. But says it in Twin Tinwill, like I said, they kind of have like a, a, a little romance soft romance budding but i don't think it really ever goes really far not to a point i i guess in memory knowing how it ends here that uh it's not important because tinfoil doesn't make it out of this book so i i think i kind of look at it that way but uh it didn't bother me or anything like that but they continue to study this metal plate and alindy's log book and they cannot figure out why alindy was opposed by others from taking the power from the well of ascension to defeat the deepness. That's the big mystery. They can't figure this out. And again, like I said, this is those preludes before each chapter. So I'll read those closely. Don't just skip over those thinking they're just nonsense. It's like Stormlight Archive. They'll make sense if you read them. So Elon now has a lot of time on his hands and he continues to investigate the poison well, but he also sneaks out of the city uh, to ask Justice, who is leading the Coloss army, uh, if he will lead them away to save more lives. Uh, this is a side plot I really don't even remember. 
Uh, I, I think there's something about like they take Elon prisoner or something like that. I think he ends up stabbing Justice. I don't recall. Uh, I just felt like it was something that wasn't super important enough for me to talk about here. So if I'm wrong on that, so be it. Uh, I just don't remember it, really. Uh, Zayn returns to Vin and suggests that they go take out Set to force his army to withdraw, and she agrees. Uh, much to Orser's complaints and, and protests, she agrees to do it. And they kill all of Set's guards, and they reach him and his son. She throws his son to the ground. She's about to kill him, and she's able to regain control at the last moment and let Set and his son live. But Zayn is pretty much disgusted and leaves because that's what he does best. He just takes his ball and goes home. He just loves it, don't he? Uh, but Set realizes his army is weakened and his claim for the throne is denied. So he decides to withdraw his forces. So one less thing, right? Uh, but then it keeps being drawn to Credit Shaw, which is where the Lord Ruler took residence. And she doesn't know why she is drawn there. But at the same time, Zane kills a would-be assassin and goes to control, or sorry, goes to confront Straff, uh, who who in turn uh, offers him an inheritance. But again, Zen does what he does best and just leaves. He takes a mist cloak with him. Uh, I guess this is his like uh, going to the light side of the force moment because uh, he's, he's he's out from underneath Straff's rule and he's gonna go be his own man kind of thing, right? He's gonna go get Vin. He's gonna get the girl. He's gonna leave town. And they're gonna have. Uh, happily ever after, right? There's not too much happily ever after in these stories. Come on. But uh, Vin is kind of pouting about how she's messed up in this book. And she's not wrong. She's made a lot of mistakes in this book. That's why I don't call her Mary Sue, guys. She makes mistakes. Uh, but she hears a distant thumping and decides that it is the Well of Ascension being restored. I'm sure it has more point or more build up to it in the book. That's just what I remember. Uh, that hey, wait a second, she hears a thumping and she already knows that it's the Well of Ascension? Okay, I, I'm sure there's a detail there that I'm missing. That's just what I recall. But Zane shows up and asks Vin one last time to leave with him. And she's tempted, like I said, since she knows that he'll never understand or that Elon will never understand her like a, another misborn will. But she decides at the last moment out of loyalty to Elon and his trust in her that she's not going to do that. But instead of running away like usual, he loses his shit and decides to end the relationship by attacking her. And she asks Orser for help during the fight, and he ignores her and helps Zane instead. Oh, man, here's where we discover that Tensoon, as Orser, was a Conjure spy the whole time. Tensoon, son of a bitch. Uh, when this actual switcheroo happened, I don't recall. I really don't. And I should have looked that up, but I, but I didn't. But it was a big old nut punch because I was really liking Orser at this point. And yeah. I never, never would have thought that this, that this was the whole whole story here, but uh, yeah, he was a spy the whole time, and he's working with uh, he's working with Zane. But Tensoon has kind of grown loyal to Ben at this point, and he eventually helps her anyway, giving her the medals that she needs to fight. And Ben eventually gets the upper hand and runs Zane through the neck with a knife, and he lies dying. And as he's dying, we get a POV from him where he reveals that the voice in his head was that of something posing as God. And guys, forgive me if I'm wrong here. I don't believe it's referred to as name. But this is Ruin. Okay, uh, again, I don't remember if they actually refer to it as name here. Or if you're just supposed to be able to put these things together. But this is Ruin. And that's a big deal for the whole greater Cosmere. I think that's really really cool and he was posing as god to get him to do what he wanted uh yeah that's some dark shit but ten soon says his contract is void now since dane is, zane is dead dane is dead dane is dead <laughs> since zane is dead and he asks vince forgiveness before saying goodbye uh but uh elon considers how to deal with the Colos army when Vin shows up and tells him the truth about zane and if i recall correctly they had set up that elon had proposed to her before and she didn't say no, but she didn't say yes kind of thing. Like I said, there's the whole time jump between the between the thing there. You feel like it isn't just like super rushed here. It isn't like, I love you, I love you, let's get married. Uh, but uh, they do end up married here. And I don't remember it feeling super rushed. So uh, I feel like it was done in a way that was appropriate. And uh, says that performs a ceremony, but then suggests that they get out of Luthadel and go find the Well of Ascension because it's not here. It's anywhere but here. 
Uh, but as they leave, Seiza does feel guilty for lying to them about the well and making them leave to save their own lives before the Coloss attack the city. So Spook goes, Spook goes with Ben and Elin, and he knows that something is following them, and Ben confirms that it is the Mist Spirit that she has been seeing this whole time. And uh, the further they get from Luthadel, the quieter the thumping in her head, uh, the thumping of the well. It gets so quiet they decide to go ahead and head back to Luthadel, realizing what Seiza did in line to them to get them away from the, the city. Uh, ben is actually faster, you know, using her coins to fly back. So she's able to get back to the city before uh, Spook and Elin. And she arrives and she finds the Coloss attacking the city and joins the battle. Uh, and here's where you start getting some deaths, man. It sucks. Uh, Clubs is killed by a Coloss. And Doxin actually like tries to run and he gets killed too uh, once they breach Keep Venture. And I'm just like, Jesus Christ. Uh, I mean, you have a crew this big. I figured you were going to have some deaths. I guess I just kind of thought there would be a little bit more going out in glory. Not so much. And you know what? I like that because that's war. You know, you don't always get the blaze of glory. You don't always get the fancy one-liner or the sacrifice. Sometimes you just die. That's it. You know, it could be a stray arrow. It could be an explosion. It don't matter. Sometimes you just die without, you know, any anything important happening. You just die. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I know some people kind of felt disappointed by these deaths because, you know, they were, they were not meaningful. But, uh, again... If you have a, a battle and all the time your core characters make it out alive, it just shows that it isn't really important. So, uh, yeah, I respect him for actually having the testicular fortitude to kill off some of his main characters here. Uh, but uh, not main. I, I guess you would call them still secondary or tertiary characters. But like I said, I love this whole crew, so all the deaths bother me. So Alrian then asks her father to help save the city. But he declares that he will bend the knee to Straff instead, and that sometimes good men die. Uh, so Sit's just done with all this. But Event arrives at the last moment. She saves Sezed, who's actually like balling out. He's you know, using his uh, ferrochemy bracelets or whatever to fight to fight off a uh, Coloss, whatever. But uh, she realizes there's just too many to fight alone, and she remembers what Tensu told her about the Lord Ruler putting a built-in failsafe, basically, on the Conjurer and the Coloss. And here is where the Duralumen comes in as it allows her to control the Coloss telepathically and she makes them stop the attack and she points them at Straff's forces outside the walls and has them charge and attack his army. And Straff sees Vin flying right towards him before she slices him and his horse up. Uh, I didn't feel like it was necessary to kill the horse, but you know, again, this is war. Sometimes those things happen. But uh, yes, Straff is down. So. It's got to be a real cool feeling to go back to uh, your now spouse and be like, oh yeah, by the way, I kill killed your father tonight. No big deal. No big deal, right? Uh, something tells me he'll struggle through it. But uh, Set's daughter forces his hand by charging into the battle against Strath's reigning forces, and he joins in and helps out. And uh, yeah, he does never get to have to admit that he wasn't going to help them. So uh, yeah, it's nice when you're on the winning side, right? But after the battle ends, Vin forces Penrod and Set to bend the knee to Elon and accept his rule as emperor. So, uh, yeah, that's the best kind of enforcer you could possibly have right there, I think. But uh, later on, right as you feel like the book's about to end, uh, no, you realize you still got like uh, 60, 70 pages left. And that's when we get Vin, Elon, Hammond, and Spook head to Credit Shaw to find the Well of Ascension. That's where it's going to be. The Miss Spirit encounters Sezed. It's kind of suggesting that he stops Vin from finding the well, and he leads him towards Credit Shaw too. And once Sezed shows up, boom, he is stopped by Marsh, who attacks him. Uh, they fight, and Marsh is about to kill him when Hammond hits Marsh from behind. I was like, damn, Sanders, don't kill Sezed off too. Or, But Hammond saves him by knocking Marsh out. But Vin and her group head deeper into the cavern, where they find a source of light that turns out to be a glowing white pool. And you figure out, okay, this is very clearly the Well of Ascension, right? Elin finds a disc of clay by the well that has metal inside it, but then the mist spirit arrives and stabs Elin in the stomach. And I'm like, son of a bitch, Sanderson, you are brutal. I'm thinking, wow, you've went full George R.R. R. Martin here. You're just killing off everybody. Um, but then walks into the pool, hoping that the power she gains can allow her to save Elin. And she's in so much pain when she gets the power, when it enters her body, she hears a voice that tells her, you know, that she knows what she has to do. 
and it tells her that the deepness is killing the mist. So she lets the power go, and then the same voice responds, I am free, and this is ruin, obviously. Okay, uh, wow, so she's just let it go, and Vin goes to Elin. She's just gonna comfort him as he dies. The well is now empty, the voice is gone, and the mist spirit brings her attention to the metal disc, or the, the, the piece of metal that was in the disc of clay, and she feeds the metal to Eland, who then burns Pewter to save his own life. So, wow, Eland is an Alamancer now. I'm assuming a Mistborn now. Wow, okay, there's a twist. So, uh, yeah, I did not expect that, but you know what? I'm just happy that Eland's going to live, because I like Eland. But uh, in the epilogue, we get that Sazed finally figures out that the rubbings in the metal plate do not match, and the translation is actually... Quote, Alindi must not reach the Well of Ascension, for he must not be allowed to release the thing that is imprisoned there. So obviously, Ruin was messing around with those uh, translations there. But Vin speculates that she has something has set something upon them much worse than the Lord Ruler ever was, as credits roll. So uh, while I feel like this one isn't nearly the standalone that the first book could have been, uh, this one tells its own story but obviously leaves it open to what we now know is the third and final chapter and guys i feel like this is every bit as good as a follow-up as you can have it's not quite empire strikes back in nature but it does end on kind of that down note you know because that's what life is a series of down notes i watched clerks recently uh, <laughs> but uh i thought it was a very good follow-up definitely left enough hooks in me to where I wanted to see what happened next. And looking at this from a greater perspective now of the Cosmere, I uh, won't go too much into it because I haven't got to my Stormlight stuff yet, so I don't want to feel like I'm I'm spoiling things there. But the whole ruin and preservation revelation in this, uh, I'll just say, guys, obviously that means a big deal uh, as far as the Cosmere as a whole. So uh, that's really a neat thing that I figured out. Like I said, that I wasn't looking for the first time that I read this, just like I wasn't looking for Hoyd the first time that I read these. So uh, it's interesting little things that you'll pick up once you know about the whole Cosmere being a whole thing. That's a really nice little bonus, and I think that's what makes reading all of his books worthwhile. Like the, uh, a little bit more, but like the, the, the King Multiverse, when you read those things, and some people just consider them like Easter eggs, I, I think they mean so much more when you know that. Like, when a character from Salem's Lot shows up in Dark Tower, and you're just like, whoa, if you've read Salem's Lot, you're like, holy crap, that's awesome. If you haven't read you're like, okay, that's interesting. You don't really know. But when you know these things, it, it adds like a nice little bonus for the longtime readers there. So that's the kind of things that I love about the Cosmere now that I know that they exist. And like I said, guys, if I had the time, I definitely would have reread this because just, like I said, skimming through these to remember everything has made me really nostalgic to a point where I'm like, God, I had such a good time with these books and I, I think I'd have an even better time in a reread knowing all of the foreshadowing. So uh, that's where I'm at, guys. Uh, just like the previous book, I gave this one a four out of five when I first read it. I gave all three of these books four out of five because I do feel like they are one long story and I feel like each one provides something different enough that they don't just feel like carbon copies of the one that came before it. So uh, yeah, the, uh, the character deaths are a big deal in this. I felt like the politics were very intriguing. A lot of the stuff was set, completely blew my mind. I wasn't expecting that at all. Felt like they were very, very Game of Thrones-ish in that way. Um, you know what? I don't like calling it Game of Thrones. I call it a Song of Ice and Fire because, like I said, I read it before the show. But that's just become part of our pop culture now, I felt at this point. But, so that's beside the point. But very, very high recommends. If you've read the first book, I obviously think that you would have probably liked this one. I can understand... Like I said, some people won't like this one because it is a lot more politics, but I felt like that third act was the usual Sanderson, like, holy crap. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to revisiting uh, the final book, Hero of Ages, next. And um, I'll say, like I said, I've been kind of skimming through these, and I've been putting my notes together for uh, for Hero of Ages. And there's some stuff I totally forgot about in that book. I think it's because I read it in, like, two days because I was so excited. Uh, after the way this one ended, I could not wait. I took a break between Final Empire and... And, uh, and Well of Ascension when I first read it. But uh, this one I picked up immediately because I had to know what happened. And uh, yeah, there's some surprises in there that I, I, that I actually forgot about. And uh, next episode is probably going to be me moaning about the ending for 30 minutes. Now, is that good moaning or bad moaning? Uh, I guess you'll just have to tune in and find out. So guys, thank you so much for, uh, for hanging with me in this. And like I said, 
please feel free to drop in the comments. I know I missed things. Like I said, I read this three plus years ago. I know I forgot stuff. Maybe I misinterpreted some things. It does happen. I never claim to be a historian on these things. These are never meant to be a book report. Just me talking about how I felt while I read them. So I hope you'll take that into account before you you know, get out the red ink pen and grade me too harshly or whatever. Uh, but uh, I'm just glad you're here and uh, I look forward to talking to you guys in the comments below. So drop in there and I'll talk to you there.